We wish to advise that tonight's episode of Australian Story contains coarse language. kids out of here, I don't want to be in the same place as he is. But that just devastated me. I couldn't believe it had got to that. And then while I'm not those things. I'm proud of my life. You know, I'm still going to drive everybody out there crazy for the next 50 years doing my entertaining because I'm an artist. That's what I want to do. Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. Johnny Young may have been out of the headlines lately, but his legend lingers on. His television show, Young Talent Time, ran for 18 years and launched stars like Tina Arena, Deborah Byrne and Danny Minogue. Now 53, Johnny Young is starting over, professionally and personally. Tonight, for the first time, he speaks about the ups and downs of his life and some unsavoury rumours he's been unable to shake off. This is Johnny Young's story. It's incredible. I've got no idea what this place looks like where we're going to work, you know. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Sitting like this, I always feel like Elvis. In order to be a true entertainer, in order to be able to communicate on a level that people can relate to, you have to have your heart open and opening your heart up to people makes you vulnerable and then if someone kicks it really hurts big time After 40 years of being an entertainer, I still get nervous before any performance. My tummy still goes a little bit butterfly-y, but I wouldn't miss it for the world. For me, I feel like I had rockitis interruptus. The best time of my life was when I was a kid playing in a rock and roll band. I swore when I was doing Young Talent Time that when I, you know, got a little older and I wasn't doing that anymore, that I'd get back to being with my band and being a singer-songwriter like I was in the beginning. Perhaps I'm a little wiser these days, but I never want the adventure to stop. I want to keep going, keep going, you know, let's party, because life is there to be enjoyed, isn't it? New beginnings are exciting, and especially for me at this time of my life when not only am I starting again in my career in a brand new phase, but also my personal life too, because I got married on Christmas Eve to the most beautiful lady in the world. I this is the best one of the lot. Me on my knees. Where are Never lines? thought it would ever happen. Well, we went to Bali and we eloped. It was like a fairy tale. It was beautiful. We danced around each other for years and years and years. We were great friends. We've always been great friends. And, you know, I did a bit of running away for a while and, uh, you know, every time I'd get cold feet and, and Rose would say, oh, you know, OK, we'll take our time. You go and do what you have to do. And then, you know, then I'd come back and then we'd, on we'd go. And then eventually I just said, well, I can't live without you. I, I want to I wanna go and tie the knot. What did you say? He said... Say that again? They said, say that again. <laughs> and he said, I can't live without you. Sometimes... Oh, oh it's good. Hey, you should see these tomatoes. Look at this. That's going to be a nice crop. Beautiful. Rosewood, the cottage, is set on 30 acres of beautiful land about an hour and a quarter outside of Melbourne. 
and it has no electricity. We run the house from batteries. After my life had changed so drastically at the end of the 80s and all of the young talent time thing was over and my you know, marriage was on shaky grounds, I decided the only thing I could do was to Come trust on, God, on. trust the force, trust, you know, that life would take me somewhere interesting where I needed to be. Little did I know I'd wind up in a jail in the Philippines. Okay, 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 okay. The man known to millions of Australians as the King of Kids, Johnny Young, is to be investigated by the authorities in the Philippines. Entertainer Johnny Young is tonight facing a Filipino immigration hearing which could see him deported from the country. He would be in the first battalion for his role in the alleged running of an illegal AIDS clinic raided last week on the island of Cebu. Part of that story um, was never really told and uh, I mean there was a bunch of Australians there who were all very ill in the Philippines and my father was the only other person there other than the doctor who was, who was actually assisting these dying people. The hearing started under the glare of widespread local media interest. He was absolutely devastated by the way that the media had attacked him. He felt betrayed, particularly because he'd given so much to the television industry and this same industry was now stabbing him in the back. From the moment I was able to listen to records, I wanted to be a singer. And by the time I was 17, I had my first television show called Club 17, where I was the host and my band did all the backings and uh, I sang songs on the show as well. From 1965 to 1970, that was my full-on pop star period. It was a fantastic experience, touring, meeting my idols. Hey, I got to meet Bob Dylan. I toured with the Rolling Stones. I was focused on being a pop star and doing concerts and all of that stuff and wild and screaming and, you know, all that it entails. And lots of girls and, yes, lots of sex and lots of everything, you know, it was fantastic. Uh, and uh, it was the, the real pop star trip. Just before I went over to London, I'd, I'd had all my television exposure and my gold records and everything, and I thought I was ready to take on the world, you know, I really felt a big deal. So I arrived in London and really felt I was going to take the place by storm. Unfortunately, it didn't happen that way. London being a very large place and full of aspiring talents, um, I sort of died on my feet, as it were. Take 23, are we rolling? Ready? Yeah, let's go. Roll Well, right now we're working on a new CD, and I'm optimistic enough to believe that we've got just as much chance as anybody else of having a hit. No limit to the silence. Nobody wants the truth. No limit to the violence. Just blame it on the youth trying to write songs and record songs that have some meaning, you know, that have some, some truth to them. Rich boys get the tax break. Poor boys are out of luck. Whoa, no limit, no limit. I'm excited and nervous about this album because it's the first lot of songs that I've recorded in years and years and years. And, uh, well, there's been plenty of life experience in the meantime. No bit more to do. Fuck, I've lost my mind. Johnny, if there'd been a young talent time in Holland after World War II, you'd have been on it. Everybody in Rotterdam knew this irresistible three-year-old. He used to ride the trams singing to the other passengers. You're born Johnny Benjamin de Jong, the youngest of four children on March the 11th, 1947. Your I think father, being from a migrant family and having migrated out from Holland after the war, that gave my father a drive, an ability to be self-made and to reinvent yourself. I think being the little Dutch boy in Perth in the 50s, uh, my father had to work really hard to be recognised um, amongst all the other competing influences at that time. Your father, Jan, is with the army in Indonesia and doesn't see you for the first time until you are two. It wasn't until years later that I discovered an amazing story that the, the man that I thought was my dad and that I called Pa and who I loved 
wasn't really my father at all. During the two and a half, three years that Pa was in Indonesia, my mum fell in love, guess what, with a singer, with a band singer, someone very much like me, you know, young 17, 18-year-old kid who was singing uh, at, at the American army bases and mum went along because she just absolutely loved and adored music and she met this young man and they fell in love. And uh, I was the the uh, the product of of that joyous union. Downtown time, episode 86, 004. Replay is scheduled, take one. I was 40 by the time I got the courage to do something about it. And I called a private detective agency in Amsterdam and I said, this is the name of the man and this is where he lived during World War II and just after. So you see what you can find out. Four days later, I get a phone call <laughs> saying, Yes, he's still living in the same little village and here's his phone number and he's married and he's got three kids. Oh, wow, what do I do with this, you know? He'd guessed that, that there was something there from his sister and other members of the family, but because he was the result of a wartime affair, uh, as were many, many children of that era, um, it, was kept, uh, it was kept quiet. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the sort of thing that, that people talked about then. Then Pa died, and uh, I thought, oh, here's, here's my opportunity, right? So I rang my mother and I said, Mum, you know, I, I've met my biological father. You've what? Yeah, yeah, I've met him, and I want you to know, I still remember saying it, I, I, I want you to know that I love you anyway. You know, there's no judgment from me. There's, there's no sort of, you know, I'm not, I'm not condemning you. I just needed to know and I followed it up and I'm sorry if it hurt you. And she said, no, if you're happy, I'm happy. John had an idea of actually getting his two parents together who were elderly before they passed on. They hadn't seen each other since the war years when they'd had the affair that produced my father. And I think for my father, that was a very special moment. So... <laughs> Uh, down the road we went to the local pub and I had a, an hour with my mum and my dad, my biological mum and dad, together and it was heaven. It was beautiful and I could feel all of those feelings that you feel, you know, with your, your biological parents. I could see why there was, was so much about my personality that I did, couldn't reflect in my stepfather. And the sad thing for me and the and the positive thing for me is that I feel so strongly about my stepfather, the guy who raised me. He was my dad. He brought me up and the values that I have in my life, I learned from him and the joy and the music that I have in my life, my mother gave me. It's Young Talent Time, starring Johnny Young with a little help from his friend, the Young Talent Team. Would you like to ride in my beautiful balloon? I never knew from the very first episode how long Young Talent Time would last. It's not like I ever sat down and said, this will do me, I can do this for the next 20 years and I'll blah, blah, blah. No. These are our six Young Talent members and I'd like you to meet them because they're very talented people. Firstly, Rod. Hi. And Debbie. Well, for and me, Philip. the charm of it all and was that I had been a pop star, travelled around the world and done all of that and when Young Talent Time started in 1971-72 I was ready to settle down. I married Kathy and we had our two daughters. My kids came on, you know, my life, my private life was exactly the same as what was happening on screen. That's why it was so yummy. But I know you're going to give a very warm welcome to a young lady who I think is kind of nice. It's my little daughter Annie. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. I believe family programming should be exactly that. It should be able to be watched by kids, grandparents, parents, you know, the whole shebang. Because I love, 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 and ended up as musical director for another nine years in all, and I left when I was about 28. John's image on the show was always one of um, sugary sweet, uh, let's sing the Candy Man, 
um, all that kind of stuff. Boy next door, having a great time, king of the kids, and lots of smiles, and let's sing all my loving at the end. Close your eyes, come with me, and we soon will be. I think I developed that persona when I was about 18 months old, actually. I always managed to get myself out of trouble by being charming. After school, my brother would get into trouble if he wasn't home at the dinner table by six o'clock. And I'd walk in the kitchen and I'd say, sorry, mum, <laughs> you know, and put on the biggest, charmingest <laughs> sorry in the world and I got away with it, always. And that was, that was the Johnny Young. That's where I created the Johnny Young. Johnny Young came out of that understanding that you win more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. There were always rumours and stories about John because no one could ever believe that he was uh, as sweet and as flawless as he appeared. And of course he wasn't. Of course he had flaws. And I know all the years that I worked with the show and afterwards, there were lots of uh, rumours about, well, any grown man that spends so much time with uh, young children must have a problem there. I think that 50% of the audience that regularly watched the show watched it because they loved him. I think 50% of the audience that regularly watched the show loved to watch it because they hated him. Unfortunately for me, at exactly the same time when we were getting the toughest opposition we'd ever had, I'd invested all of our hard-earned money into a television facility because we were going to produce Young Talent Time ourselves in our own studios. And so I had the studios built and suddenly the plug was pulled on Young Talent Time, so I had a studio without a show. Kids, you can talk till you but that was horrible. I'd lost a lot of money and it was the beginning of the end of a lot of things for me. During that, in 1989, I lost my television program, I lost my mother and my stepfather and my marriage, pretty much. It all fell over in that one year, all at the one time. And why it all happened all at once, I don't know. You know, maybe because God knows that I can't handle too much pressure, so <laughs> I'll give it to them all at once. But it was, it was tough. And it was especially tough because I felt that I'd let down my family because it was the family house that I lost. I lost the family jewels and, uh, you know, I, I felt it deeply and I was very ashamed of myself that I hadn't protected my family financially more than what I had. I think the reason John came here to sort of hibernate in the bush was to heal because life had got a bit tough and he needed to get away from people. Life recenter and hopefully, well I'm sure it's done it for him. To add to the confusion and the complication of it, I got a phone call from a friend who happened to be gay, who happened to have AIDS, to say that he was dying and he needed a mate to support him while he went on a miracle cure to the Philippines. That turned out to be a nightmare for him and for me. John Young, when he gets a bond with a person, it's a strong bond. Terry Higgins uh, contracted HIV and John and Terry became very, very good friends. Terry directed Young Talent Time for a period of time. It was a tragic situation. One minute Terry was extremely healthy and jovial and laughing and the fun person that he had always been. Within 12 months I saw Terry from a very, very strong, confident person turn up, turn out to be this very frail person who who didn't want to die, he didn't want to die, he didn't understand what was going on. Facing allegations that he's involved in running an AIDS clinic, Young has told a court that he's in Manila to comfort a friend who has AIDS. And the experience of the Philippines for me was both heaven and hell. The heaven part was that there was roughly 20 people, not all gay, several girls, the strangest bunch of people, but 
so much love, so much optimism, so much positivity. I mean, here are people all at the end of their life. It wasn't like they just had, you know, the beginnings of HIV. They were there um, for their last chance. My daughter Jodie, who was uh, 22 at the time, had contracted HIV around about the age of 18. Jodie and I were told that John um, was going to be with us when we were at the airport at Cebu. So the first we saw of John was when he, he climbed onto the bus with his guitar in hand. And uh, Jodie and I went, nudged each other and thought, you know, this is amazing, you know, what's this guy doing here? Even if, for instance, he's a known uh, TV personality in Australia, he has a lot to explain before the Philippine authorities. When the place got raided, because it was a legal clinic which nobody knew, everybody at the clinic had done a bunk. All the nurses and doctors and the people who'd set it up, they just all disappeared. And so they said, you'll do, and they put me through the ringer. Here without any logical reason whatsoever. I was really proud of, of my father and what he did. No one was interested in helping these people because they were doing an alternative thing. One of them needed a blood transfusion, so he marched on down to the docks and found an Australian ship and walked onto the ship and they went, Johnny Young, what are you doing here? And he said, I need X pints of blood for these Australian people. And the sailors volunteered and he walked out with an esky full of blood and went down and, and for, the, for the time being anyway, these people were, were, were looked after. in the end that all the charges were dropped. I saw a side to John Young that I never would have known and I feel privileged to have shared with him in an intimate situation with all of those people but particularly with Jodie. He spent time with her, talking to her about dying. She was incredibly terrified about what was beyond and it was in that that John um, was able to meet Jodie where she was at literally and help her in that, to, ga to gain that peace of mind and strength and courage. Police in the Philippines have forced entertainer Johnny Young to undergo an AIDS test. Then when I came back, it even got worse because, and it didn't occur to me at the time, but it's like, well, Johnny Young does this program with children. What's he doing in an AIDS clinic was the thought, right? And it raises thoughts in people's heads. What is he gay? What's he, you know, why has he got a gay friend? You know, he was a friend. The, the fact that he was gay got nothing to do with it. He had lots of gay friends and Irish friends and Jewish friends and Catholic friends and all sorts of friends. But that was, that was the, the, the toughest part. The eight patients returned today to be caught in the controversy surrounding ozone treatment. I remember one of the guys in the group saying when he returned at the airport, he had cameras shoved in his face and reporters screaming at him, you know, is John Young gay? Is he pedophile? It just went into absolute hysteria. Look, I've had people talk to me about, you know, why John was in the Philippines. You know, why was he there? There's nothing to even be curious about. I said, John was over there for X, Y and Z. Oh, there must be more to it than that. And I said, no, there isn't. <laughs> That's it. And it's no matter how much or how many times you try and tell people the absolute truth about what was going on, they don't want to hear it. They want to make up something different to the, to the truth. John's not an idiot. John's aware of every rumour and every story out there. And I think they actually still hurt him, even though he should be hard enough, you'd think, over the years to, to, to be able to wear it. But he's, he is a very emotional person too. This guy saw me and he said, that's Johnny Young. Get the kids out of here. I don't want to be in the same place as he is. Right now, that just devastated me. It just completely devastated me. I, I, I couldn't believe it. It knocked me about. I couldn't talk to people for days. I, 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 I couldn't believe it had got to that. And, and then I thought, well, you know, how do I defend this? Well, you can't. You, you know, if I defend it, it's like thou protesteth too much. If I've ever been inappropriate with a juvenile, with a younger person, don't you think they would have come out of the woodwork by now to get their lousy $100,000 off the media for the expose? But there's nothing to expose. Ultimately, 12 months after the ozone treatment, Terry was back in Australia and was hospitalised at Fairfield Hospital. His family and close friends and John Young were there. 
Terry was basically in a coma and I knew that he wasn't going to survive that night. And took his last breath and that was it. And once Terry died and I looked across the room and, and I saw John, it was... Uh, it added to the horrific moment. I, I felt that John, part of John died as well. For John to be back performing with the boys in the band has been like a tonic. You know you make me want to shout, throw my hands up and shout, take my hands up and shout, throw my hands up and shout. John needed about five years to start believing in himself again, I think. Not that he didn't believe in John, but believing in himself as as an entertainer, as as what he could give to to the public. I'm happy to say what I am. What I am is a complex, quirky artist. I'm an artiste. I belong in the Middle Ages as a court jester in some you know, King's Court, they'd love me there. Uh, that's me. I'd also like to say what I'm not. I'm not bent, I'm not queer, I'm not an abuser of children. I'm not those things. I'm proud of my life. I'm proud of what I've done with my career and continue to do. You know, I'm still going to drive everybody out there crazy for the next 50 years doing my entertaining because I'm an artist. That's what I want to do. Tina Arena. Here's Tina. He's kissing me. What's he going to sing, do you know? I'm your little boy. That's right. Here's Jamie Redford. Here's Danielle. We like to sing. If you...